Doyle has done a brand new interview for Guitar Connoisseur magazine. And before we get into it, we've never really done a Doyle episode, right? Um, it's always about Jerry and Glenn, yada, 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 one, two, three, X, Y, Z. Um, we don't talk about Doyle enough. So real quick, before we even get to it, let's a little intro to Doyle. I mean, we all know who Doyle is. For those who are not aware, maybe for the f- guy who doesn't know anything about the Misfits and the Silence of Bees, first, that would never happen. Come on. I mean, that, w- that would never happen. Um, Doyle is Jerry and Rocky's younger brother, the Kayafa K- family, live in Lodi, Grove Street. Used to, not anymore. Um, he came into the band. He learned how to play guitar from Jerry and Glenn. He came into the band uh, right after his 16th birthday. Uh, first show, Halloween, Irving Plaza, 1980. Opening up for Screaming Jay Hawkins. How about that? That's right. The Misfits opened up for Screaming Jay Hawkins. Could you imagine your first show, professional show in a band, is opening up for the legendary Screaming Jay Hawkins, who was wallowing in obscurity at that time. It was, Screaming Jay Hawkins was very, very accessible uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. He was he was performing. It, you could literally walk into a small, I, I forgot what it was. It was a small cafe lounge on the Lower East Side type deal, and Screaming Jay Hawkins would be playing the piano. It was like that. And uh, it kind of kills me that I wasn't born yet because I would just totally be there every day and just watch. I'd be like Screaming Jay Hawkins' personal assistant and butler and drive him around. And it would be really awesome. Um, so they opened for Screaming Jay Hawkins. Uh, and Bobby Steele showed up to the show. He didn't know that he was out of the band. Long story. Everybody knows that story. Doyle joins the band. He stays with the band. The band's lineup stabilizes. We talked a little about this previously. I'm not going to go too deep into it. He stabilizes the band's lineup in in a way that it would remain stabilized, not excluding all the, the Graves years. It remains stabilized as as Glenn, Jerry, and Doyle, the three guys. It's Uncle Glenn, Uncle Jerry, and Cousin Doyle. I call – he uh, Doyle is not an uncle. He's a cousin. Cousin Doyle. <laughs> I don't know why. Cousin Doyle. I like that. Um, and, you know, he did Christ the Conqueror with his brother, which turned into the Misfits. In the, but that's the interim. But as a Misfits with Glenn Danzig, never had another Misfits guitarist after Doyle. And I know – some of you nerds will be like, well, actually, AC Slade is also a guitarist. Yes, AC Slade is is there as well. But I'm just talking about in the sense that the lineup was stabilized from 1980 on, if you think about it like that, which makes sense. It made sense for, besides the fact that Jerry probably wanted his little brother in the band, it probably made sense politically. Um, it made It made things more convenient. It made things easier. They didn't have... Their guitarist wasn't living in another city anymore, in another state. You know, Bobby was in New York, and and those guys were in Jersey. And, you know, now all he had to do was knock on Doyle's door, and Doyle would be ready to to play. And they could even take him out on the road, you know, eventually. Um, so it was, it, it was good to have Doyle in the band. The band also suffered a little bit. As you know, I'm listening to this Bobby Steele interview that I, the last one, the, oh, no, sorry, the middle one from 2010. And he said, I said, so what happened to the Misfits sound after Doyle joined the band and, and you, you left? He said, well, the band's sound didn't really evolve. I asked him, how did the band evolve after you left? He said, I don't know if it evolved as much as it devolved. And I thought that was actually very, um, that was a poignant observation. The band sort of does. It devolves a little bit. They get faster. You know, Doyle is a school in Doyle comes from the school of Johnny Ramone down picking rhythm guitar playing. He's not by his own words. He's not that great of a guitarist. Here's what I will say. I've said this so many episodes. I'm just saying it here. Cause this is the Doyle episode. So I have to like repeat myself. Doyle. It, Doyle is really good at what Doyle does. That's how you have to think about it. Is he, great among like you know would you would you put him up against anybody else no but nobody does what doyle does nobody can get that sound at doyle's guitar when they 
punch a guitar, whether it's good for the sound or bad for the sound. As somebody recently said to me on the on the previous episode, I think it was, somebody mentioned, somebody blew my mind. Maybe it was in the comment section. I didn't know this. So Doyle, and maybe he'll talk about it in the interview we're going to go through. Doyle um, plays his guitar through a bass amp. I did not know that. So a lot of the, and again, not, uh, not a music guy. So I'm talking in language that is not my own. Um, a lot of the tones are, all the tones are pushed down or there's a lot of heavy bass tones, right? There's a lot of heavy, sorry. There's a lot of heavy, yeah. Heavy bass tones. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm right about that. So, so he, uh, it, it, it makes his sound deep and thick. It's kind of the reason why Glenn has a second guitarist on stage because he can't, he needs that other guitar track, a cleaner guitar track to, to sing, to play to whatever, to keep, keep in track. AC's good. AC holds things together. There's nothing wrong with AC. AC's great. Kind of wish it was Bobby Steele doing it, but it's AC. And again, good on AC for having that job. And, and he's great where he is. He makes the band sound great. I, I, I'm really, I'm really stoked that they have both AC and Dave Lombardo. Um, so yeah, so Doyle plays, he, he plays, he just has his thing. He has his shtick. He does one thing. He wears his, his, his stretch, his stretchy pants. He wears his big platform boots. He's super muscular. He's got, I mean, there's there any more muscular guitarists than Doyle? You don't think of guitarists as like these muscle bound guys. Like that's what Doyle is. He's like a He-Man actor action figure with a guitar, which surprises me that those guys never did He-Man versions of Jerry and Doyle. Like they should just do a whole Misfits He-Man line. Wouldn't you like to see that? I, I think that would be really, really great. I think that would work really nicely. Um, he builds, he also builds his own guitar. So the guy, you know, people liked again, and I see a little bit in the comments. So I'm trying to ignore it, trying to ignore the comments, but I see a little bit. So I heard somebody call him dumb or whatever you can call Doyle dumb all you want and he may come off that way, but let's, let's give Doyle the credit where credit is due. Doyle knows how to build a guitar from scratch. He engineered his own guitars. Did he make the actual parts themselves? No, but he figured out how to put that all together. He makes guitars. That's number one, right? Number two, he writes songs like it or hate the Doyle stuff, which I think he calls iron punk. I think Sal, one day Sal said, yeah, they're trying to brand themselves as iron punk when we were in Sal's kitchen shooting an episode of Rock and Roll Cooking with Sal B. Um, they called themselves iron punk. To me, I don't know. It just sounds like metal. You know, I, I like, I like, there are a couple of songs I really enjoy. It's not, uh, Doyle's music is not particularly my cup of tea. It's okay. You know, just metal stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, he is an accomplished songwriter. You can't, I, I don't know about that gorgeous Frankenstein stuff, but, you know, he, the dude does know how to write a song. He writes all the music for all the Doyle stuff. You know, I've seen Doyle live where it's just Doyle with his guitar and he knows how to play. There's just a lot of people. They're like, <laughs> talk about conspiracy theorists. There's this conspiracy that Doyle is just like unplugged all the time or Doyle is never really playing or is not playing. Of course he's playing, dude. Of course he's freaking playing. And the proof of that is that like, go see a Doyle show. You'll see Doyle play, dude. Like he knows how to play guitar, good or bad or whatever you think about it. The dude can play a guitar. He can program drum tracks. He can play the bass. Doyle and from my understanding, he does a little bit of singing, although not in a serious way, but more of like a scratch, scratch takeaway, which is why I think, honestly, I truly think that Alex Story and Doyle make a great team. They, they really complement each other very, very well. I think it's good that those two found each other and found a way to make it work. But more on that in a second. Let's, let's go through a little bit more of Doyle's history. So... The band breaks up. We uh, the Christ the Conqueror years turn out to be like a guitar building workshop, where they workshop songs and they workshop their guitars and they're refining what will eventually emerge almost a decade later in the '90s, right? As the Misfits '95. 
They do the Misfits 95. They get a new singer, a young guy. He comes into the fold and they go out. They record two albums of music that sounds nothing like the previous Misfits at all. So already you have that brand confusion. Um, Doyle leaves the Misfits. Uh, I guess, you know, there was there was disharmony, a lot of stuff, disharmony. Um, you know, they did a they did a wrestling thing for a while, which was kind of weird. Um, and then what happened was, I mean, we could do a whole episode on just this one night. What happened was one night, uh the singer, um, I believe his name is Michael, right? Michael, the singer, um, Doyle and um a, a lad named uh, Dr. Chud all walked off on stage. They walked off. They walked out on Jerry. A bunch of stuff had happened between them, and they left. And then the, the uh, uh, Michael and um, David, the, the 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 Dr. Chud, his name is David. Michael and David um, never came back. And there was this weird. That's when we entered the era of weird misfits. Line of misfits, misfits. And this is when it was Jerry's fits. It was no longer the resurrected fits. It's the Jerry's fits. Jerry took over singing. And suddenly, for the first time ever, you have the weirdest mutations of lineups. You have the Earth AD lineup without Glenn Danzig with Dez from Black Flag on second guitar. And this is when Doyle leaves the band. He can't, he's not down with Jerry singing, right? He's not down with Jerry singing and Des is there. And then there are many, you know, why is Des there? Is, is that, is did, did Des, and again, I don't know the answer to this question. I genuinely don't. I'm wondering this out loud. This is not, I am not stating that I know anything. I'm just wondering it out loud. Truly, truly I am. I don't know the answer. If anybody does know the answer, I would love to know that answer. Uh, Des come, joins the band in, in some sort of effort and for the first time, they they have two guitarists. Um, why was that? Is is that Jerry and Doyle not getting along? And Jerry saying to Doyle, "Hey, man, I'll replace you, just like we we did with Zoli and Mike Hideous. Like, don't mess around with me." Was there an element of that going on? Genuinely curious to know. I truly don't. I'm not saying that's the case at all. I genuinely do not no um but that's what in interviews doyle has said i just couldn't uh, we were living a lie and I, I just couldn't deal with you know my brother singing i didn't like my brother singing i didn't want to have my brother singing anymore and so they they parted ways um jerry went on to do something called the misfits M25. Now, recently in the Lodi group, and if you're not in the Lodi, Lodi group, please join us. And by the way, if you're just joining us for the first time, please like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. Holy crap, I don't have my banner up. What's wrong with me? This was this first grade. My Lord. Um, please subscribe to this channel. If you're enjoying this content right now, we do this every Wednesday. Turn on your notifications so you know when we're going live. So when I'm running late because I can't find my black hat and I have to put on my old video business media hat, you will know exactly the moment we go live and you can join in on the conversation. Eric uh, Welteroff knows this well. He, he's always trying to be on time. He's always trying to be on time, but he's, he sounds like a real good dad planning his son's birthday party. That's awesome. It's my daughter's birthday this weekend or next week, actually, and we have to do the same. So there's that. In any case, um, we were talking in the group the other day about somebody brought up the fact of, about the Crimson Ghost, right? The Crimson Ghost logo. And I made mention of this. And this is what, what when this started happening. At some point in the year 2000, Jerry starts to copyright or trademark various things under Cyclopean Music, which is his, like, you know, his uh, publishing. And he starts to try to redesign the Crimson Ghost. And that's what some of the people didn't realize in the thing. They were like trying to figure this out because Jerry was talking about how their logo looks a lot like the Crimson Ghost. And I think what Jerry meant and what wasn't getting translated through, they were they were talking about an interview with Jerry. What wasn't coming through was the fact that Jerry, and again, brilliant move, in order to sort of 
be in more control of the mark, the mark being the Crimson Ghost, he redesigned he redesigned um, the skull and you know the Crimson Ghost to kind of look more like different, look different uh, enough that he could copyright it. And so if you look at most of the releases, now I don't know if it's every release, but if you look at a lot of the releases after the year 2000, you're going to notice that they don't have the, the traditional Misfits logo. That's Jerry trying to, I'm talking about the releases, that's Jerry trying to change the, the branding of the Misfits. There's the M25 logo. You've seen that. This should really be its own show right here. Just the, the logo changes. There is the Psycho in the Wax Museum uh, uh, seven inch logo. There is the Devil's Rain cover. All of these things is Jerry trying to rebrand the Misfits logo. And then Jerry does something that's so brilliant. I thought it was great. Sorry, go, getting sidetracked for a minute. I love, I said this when we did that, when we talked about Dead Alive, that Dead Alive thing. I love the the Jerry, the, the cover of Jerry like this. That's genius. And that's what Jerry should have done. The moment Doyle exited the band, he should have just made it fully Jerry. Just go full Jerry and call the band only Jerry. Like, boom, dude, everybody's going to know. Only Jerry, uh, only Jerry and his Misfits band, you know? <laughs> so Doyle, Doyle gets remarried. He marries Gorgeous George, the wrestler. Um, and there's a whole story with her and Macho Man and Doyle that I'm not going to get into, but it's a really funny story um, about Macho Man co coming after Doyle. And Doyle, for once, Doyle, the largest, scariest guy on earth, is actually afraid of the, the other largest, scariest guy on earth. You know, um, Great story. He starts a band with his oh that's right he so that was another thing too doyle wanted george to dance during misfit sets while jerry was singing don't quote me where i heard that i remember hearing it somewhere or reading it somewhere there was something like that and jerry was like you're out of your mind i don't want to do that again don't ah do not quote me on that not sure if i i may not know what i'm talking about i'm trying to like racking my brain right now. Where did I hear that? I heard that somewhere. Um, there was something about that, but that was the seed for what would become Gorgeous Frankenstein. Doyle starts a new band with George. The idea being that Doyle would play music for George to dance, do stripper dances, some sort of like stripper burlesque dance thing. He makes some demos. And at this time, uh, he reconnects with Glenn Danzig and involved. He also had recently reconnected with Glenn Danzig because again, right around this time in 2002, Glenn, Jerry and Doyle, I believe Doyle is out of the band by this time. Glenn, Jerry and Doyle meet up. Jerry and Glenn have spoken because of the 12 hits from hell kibosh that they put on whatever the thing on, on, on Caroline. And now they're talking about doing the misfits again. So they actually do meet up again to have those discussions. And then at some point, Glenn's father passes away. Uh, Doyle goes to the funeral. He reconnects with, with, with Glenn by themselves. Those guys start talking. He said, uh, Doyle said, uh, Glenn says, what you got? Or Doyle says, Hey, I'm working on this thing. One, one of the two, some, something like that happens. And at some point, again, I am not, I was not a fly in the wall for the conversation, but this is how the story goes. Glenn goes, I want to put it out. I'm going to put it out on Evil Life, your gorgeous Frankenstein record. And Doyle's like, that's a demo. It's not a record. And Glenn, being Glenn, is like, no, 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 we'll put it out. It's good. It's good. Hey, no, 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 let's do it. Let's do it. Let's put it out. Uh, I'll produce it. You know, I don't know what he actually produced. He did direct a music video. <laughs> Glenn directed a music video for Doyle called Man Made Monster, I think it was. Something like that. Um. So Doyle starts this band, Gorgeous Frankenstein. They need players. They get first. They get a singer. His name is Landon Blood, uh, who's no unfortunately no longer with us. Um, this guy Landon Blood from I, I guess he pulled out his demo tape or something. He was not right for the band. Doyle likes guys to fit a certain mold and image. You know, um, it, it, you know, just you know whether it's hey, 
you got to make sure you can sing like Tom Jones, right? You know, um, so 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 Landon didn't work out. Um, I think they had another drummer at the time. Both Landon and the other drummer did not work out. They also this is at some point at some time. This is when uh, you know what it is. It's through Doctor Chud. Doctor Chud had worked with Argyle Goolsby. They had done a tour. I don't know if Goolsby played on Chud's record or not. The one record that Chud has ever put out in 20 years. He put out one record. He's done 12 songs in 20 years. An inc incredibly pro prolific guy. Um, but I think it was Chud who said, hey, um, you should you should try out this guy, uh, Argyle Goolsby. He can he can write, sing, and and play bass. So Goolsby joins. He's the bass player, right? He joins as the bass player for Gorgeous Frankenstein, and then they need a drummer. And so Goolsby is in a Goolsby is in a band called Blitzkid, and he turns to his Blitzkid drummer, this uh, very young lad named Andrew Stripes Winter, who goes by the name in Blitz. Oh God, what's his Blitzkid name? Uh, he goes by the name Jesco Devilance. That's what it is. And they all literally like overnight, this guy, Jesco, he's in the band. And the very first thing they do together is they do the man-made monster music video with Glenn Danzig directing it. Um, they go out, they do some, they do a bunch of tours at some point. I don't know when at some point, um, Jesco exits. I think he exits both Blitzkid and Gorgeous Frankenstein at the same time. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, I, again, off the top, literally off of the top of my head. All of this is off the top of my head chronologically. He exits the band, and then Dr. Chud comes into the picture. So Dr. Chud joins Gorgeous Frankenstein. It's also at this time that Doyle has approached that young singer, Michael Emmanuel, um, also known as uh, Michael Graves, I think it is. And he says, hey, Michael, do you want to sing for my band, Gorgeous Frankenstein? And he gave Michael, there are some demos of Michael Graves doing Gorgeous Frankenstein songs. Um, it doesn't work out between the two of them. And as far as I know, apart from playing together live in 2009, that's the last time that they recorded together, at least publicly, maybe privately, I don't know. By the way, if you're just joining us right now, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, leave a comment. Subscribing is really key, people. I would really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, yada, yada, yada. Support the channel, buy a coffee if you if you feel like it. Leave a tip. Um, so, yeah, Michael Graves doesn't work out. Um, it's at this point. Oh, you know what it is, too? Landon might still be in the picture. I am so sloppy about this. Landon is in and out of the picture. Landon eventually washes out Landon blood. He washes out. And that's when Doyle, it might have actually been the day they did the man-made monster music video. Um, Landon uh, Landon Blood leaves and Doyle turns to, to Goolsby and says, all right, you're going to sing and play bass. So Goolsby takes over those duties. And in order to do it, Goolsby, because he, he walks around playing the bass needs, Goolsby buys a special headset to, to do that. He's, he's on this, he's on something like what I have right here, you know, um, and they're doing, a bunch of songs. They have songs called like the reverse of God and like mother, father, like all these really, all of these, all of these songs. And <laughs> I really hope you buy me a slice of pizza after you slap me Loki. Really, truly. That's all I want to say about that. So they they have a bunch of songs. I, I I listened to to these shows. I don't think it was never that good. I was not a fan of any of this material. They did uh, Graves era misfit songs that Goolsby would sing. Um, they and yeah, they just they were essentially a a three piece. It was 
Chud, Goolsby, and Doyle, and George would would do her burlesque dancing on the side on a on some sort of burlesque pole where she would burlesque on the stage. And they would open for Danzig. They opened for Danzig a whole bunch of times. As a matter of fact, one of the times they opened for Danzig is when Danzig fell into the pit and dislocated his shoulder. You know, and at the same time, Doyle is also the other thing I should mention about Doyle real quick before we get to our interviewee viewee. Oh my God, this is really going through this detailed history. I didn't expect to get so detailed. Uh, Doyle is also doing Danzig and Doyle with, with Danzig. It's also what's known as Misfits Revenge, where the, the, the reunion didn't work out in 2002. And then all of a sudden, um, you have Danzig and Doyle going, all right, F you, Jerry. We'll do it ourselves. And they're out there. And people loved it. It reinvigorated Danzig. It brought a whole – Danzig probably saw such a jump, such a jump in everything from having Doyle there. You know, he started to realize, you know, you watch those videos of Glenn holding up his microphone and he doesn't even have to sing. You know, he does Astro Zombies and everybody's just woeing for him. It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful. And again, if you've been to a Danzig and Doyle set, if you've been to an original Misfit show, you know the echo of that woe when everybody's doing it at the same time. It's unbelievable. And I think most of us as, as Misfits fans were satisfied with Danzig and Doyle doing that thing because we knew that he was never, that they were never going to reunite. You know, at the time that was huge. It was huge in the community. Oh my God, Danzig and Doyle are going to do Misfit songs. Glenn Danzig is actually acknowledging that he was in a band called the Misfits. What? What? Uh, Misfit Central. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody was just, and you know, I, I remember getting those those bootlegs, like the Electric Factory one in particular, and just listening to it over and over again. It's only like eight songs. I think they did Blood Feast over and over and over again and just reveling in the fact that these guys are doing these songs now. It just blew my mind. Anyway, back to Doyle. So Doyle's doing all of that stuff. At some point, um, Doyle and Goolsby are, are writing songs. They're, they're going to put out a new album or something. At some point, um, Alex Story enters into the equation. Alex, there are some demos of Alex Story doing gorgeous Frankenstein songs. And I got to tell you, they sound great with Alex Story. He kind of brings this Earth AD thing to some of those, whatever the demo was that I heard. And I was like, damn, that sounds like an Earth AD song. I'm going, all right. And, you know, again, that's what Doyle wants. Doyle is like a, Doyle is a one note guy. He wants a front man that fits, you know, the image that he wants for his band. And he finds it in Alex Story. Um, the lineup changes again. They do, there's this big show. It's the only time that Graves and Danzig shared a stage together in December 26, 2009. Uh, Doyle performed Misfit songs, original Misfit songs with Glenn Danzig. Uh, he performed new Misfit songs with Michael Graves. It was almost a 95 Misfits reunion. Not quite. It was Gorgeous Frankenstein with uh, Michael Graves as a guest singer. So it was three-fourths of the Misfits 95 lineup. Uh, Goolsby was on bass. At this point, Alex Story becomes the singer of Gorgeous Frankenstein. And he basically takes over, I don't know if he takes over writing duties, I don't know what happens, how that process all works. Um, that show that had Goolsby on bass and Chud on drums, Doyle on guitar, and Story singing would be the last time that Goolsby was in the band. He exits um, then, right there in 2009. They get, oh uh, God, what's his name? Um, Graham. Graham from Graves, from the Graves era. They get Graham in there. Left-hand Graham, that's his name. Sweet guy. Like, nice sweetheart of a guy. I had the pleasure to meet him in 2014. Really humble, cool dude. And left-hand Graham takes over bass duties. And they, they go out. They're doing Gorgeous Frankenstein. They're recording an album. And 
at one point, at, at some point, some time, uh, God, they're, so they're recording an album. They're recording it with this guy named Nick, who I met backstage at a Danzig show. He was, it was a Danzig and Doyle show. He was there. The guy who mixed the Obama, who, who mixed and mastered the Obaminator record, who did a, a pretty great job at what he did, I guess. Although, you know, I do think Alex's story, the vocals are a little buried. They're a little too buried. And you can, you can tell it's just a, I would have had, I don't know. It just, the, the mix is a little, little weird, but Nick did a great job of mastering all that stuff. Just really nice guy. Greek guy. I forgot his last name. Couldn't pronounce it. Greek guy. Um, he, uh, they're doing this album. Um, oh no, I am like totally messing up the history here. Wow. S excuse me. This is not 2012. What happened? Here's what happens. Um, Gorgeous George and, and Doyle break up. They break up, they get a divorce. Um, Doyle decides to change the name of the band to something that makes a lot of sense. See, and a lot of people take credit for this. Sal B told me it was his idea. Sal B said, I was the one that told Doyle, hey, why don't you just call it Doyle? Doyle claims that, I think it was Doyle who claims that he thought of it. You know, part of the problem is that Gorgeous Fra uh, Gorgeous George owned, I think she owned part of the name Gorgeous Frankenstein. She might have owned a piece of the band, but they had broken up. And they, I guess maybe it was a bad breakup. Who knows the state of the breakup? But in order to sort of separate the old from the new, because they were recording this new album, Doyle changes the band name to dot, 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 Doyle. Like, makes perfect. Perfect logical sense too. just call the band Doyle. Duh. Why wouldn't you call the band Doyle? You know, he's literally billing himself as Danzig and Doyle. It's Danzig and Doyle shows. So why, you know, because a comment that Doyle would always get a, a comment that people would always, you know, make is, oh, Gorgeous Frankenstein. I didn't know that was Doyle's band from the Misfits. That was always a problem. So why, why? Like take the layer of confusion out of the way and just uh, exactly why had Jerry struck out and just called himself only Jerry or Jerry only in friends, he would have worked. He would have, it would have worked just fine. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. I don't know. So, so they changed the name to the band. They changed the, the band's name to Doyle. They're putting out this record abominator. There is a lot of disharmony behind the scenes um, between members of the band that I don't know if I, I can't really speak to it, but there's disharmony involved in the mixing process. Doyle has publicly stated that, you know, uh, Dr. Chud messed up recording the drums because they recorded the album themselves. They built a recording studio and they recorded the album themselves. They let Chud do the engineering and Chud messed up the snare. They had to like replace, they had to replace some of Chud's drumming because he messed something up. There was something, uh, band members didn't like each other. A lot of disharmony in, in that kind of way. And um, it all came to a head in 2014. And this is where I bri ever so briefly bear witness to this band's history just for a monica tiny bit we're doing rock and roll cooking with with sal b and by the way i just found all of the uncut doyle interview segments i'm gonna re-listen to them i think i'm just gonna upload them to the channel uncut and just let everybody listen to it i think it would be fun i gotta make sure that i gotta just check it first but i'm thinking in my head i think people would enjoy that right so i'm gonna just upload all that stuff i'm sure you guys would like to see that right um, wouldn't want to hoard anything. So, so, um, we're doing this, this episode and we find out Sal B and I find out that Dr. Chud really screws over the band. He leaves Doyle and Alex story and left hand Graham without a drummer because he, he pulls, this is not the first time he's pulled this tactic. He's pulled this tactic with other bands. And the tactic is this, the day before a tour, um, demands are made for all of the money up front. I want all of the money up front or I want more money than everybody else is getting something like that, D making monetary demands of some kind. I won't, 
I won't uh, claim to know what they exactly were, but it involved money. You know, everybody's making this and Chud wanted this. And he's literally leveraging the tour, which again, involves many working components. You know, look at a guy like Bruce who invested a lot of his own money into Doyle. Because what happens is at, at a certain point, when gorgeous George exits the picture, Bruce, who was a who was Doyle's guitar tech, and he was also um, Tommy Victor's guitar tech in Danzig, he befriends Doyle and he says, I want to manage you. I want to take over for you. And honestly, the smartest thing I think Doyle ever did in, in his whole career, one of, one of the smartest things he's ever done in his whole career was hook up with Bruce. I think Bruce has been really good for Doyle and helped him do a lot of things that have allowed him to sort of, you know, go out and be Doyle, right? Um, so that happens too. And then, you know, Chud pulls this power play. Uh, he walks. He walks off the tour. He literally does the worst thing that anyone can do in the history. I mean, I, I could think of fewer sins, especially, again, hey, musicians, challenge me to, if I'm wrong. Is there any greater sin than, like, walking off a tour at all? Like, is there any greater sin than, like, leaving a band in the lurch? You know, like, just not, just just, just leaving, like, leaving and, and leaving them uh, high and dry? I, I would imagine, because there's so much staked on, you know, the thing. It's like, you can't, you're just going to leave, you know? Um, and so that's what he did. And they got Tiny, uh, Anthony Tiny, I can't pronounce his last name, from TSOL, one of my favorite bands. And I'd seen Tiny many times with TSOL. Um, so he took over and he learned the songs in like such a short period of time, like three days. He learned all these songs and they went out and they did a great job. I saw them, we saw them at Blackthorn 51. And, um, you know, just uh, just trying to you know make it make it uh, make it all work. Um, we did that rock and roll cooking up, so that's when that had happened. I I sat with it was just it, this was really cool. I wasn't in the conversation at all. I was a this is where I was a fly on the wall, so I can actually speak to this. It was me, Sal B, and Doyle, just the three of us sitting on a couch at Blackthorn right after the sound check. And Salby and, and Doyle are talking about how Chud screwed over the band Doyle and left them in the lurch without the ability, you know, without a drummer. And so I heard the, all that stuff firsthand. And um, so then what happens? So they put out Abominator, big success for Doyle, I think. It was a pretty big success. He really established himself as his own thing. You know, he established himself as his own thing without needing the misfits, which is something that Jerry has never done. See, if Jerry had, you know, taken, had, had done something else, then he could literally be out there right now. Well, maybe not right now, but like all those years that he was happy to sit on the sidelines because he was getting paid really well. He could have also been touring as some other project, the resurrected, the only Jerry, whatever. Doyle calls himself Doyle. He struck out on his own. So, you know, for all the crap that Doyle gets, I mean, you can't, I mean, the, he's a hardworking dude, you know, I mean, they, those, some of those tours that they do are grueling and his, you know, his, um, whatever his routine is grueling. He's got to put the makeup on. It's a whole big thing. Then they release Doyle two as we die. Um, and that really brings us up. And then the misfits reunite with Doyle and they do great. The band has never sounded better. The missing ingredient. I, I said all that stuff about how great Danzig and Doyle was, but we didn't know how great things could be until Jerry only came back because having the three of them together on stage, just from a fanboy perspective, like your optics, what your optic eyeballs are seeing on the stage, and you're just going, Oh my god, that's Glenn and Jerry and Doyle. Look, there's Glenn. Oh my god, that's Jerry and there's Doyle, and they're all together. They're on the stage. Oh my god, you know, like just freaking out that this is actually happening. Um, and they sound great, dude. They sound tight, they're phenomenal. Again, will they do an album? That's a topic for another day. So Doyle has done interviews over the years. He's really opened up a lot because he used to, like in the Misfits days, he never did interviews, right? Like 
in well definitely not in the 77 to 83 days but he never did interviews in in the in the 90s and he really started to do interviews first he kind of had a talking piece a, a mouthpiece do the interviews for him there's interviews of him with Chud and Goolsby and Goolsby's doing all the talking or Chud's doing some talking Chud's not Chud should never do interviews ever and doesn't like to do interviews because if you ever hear Chud do an interview he literally can't talk he cannot go Google, go, go, go on YouTube right now and go search Dr. Chud interview. And you'll see, ah, hey, I'm Dr. Chud, bro, <laughs> bro. <laughs> now I need Loki. Loki, where are you with your left? <laughs> uh, I just want to say this real quick. This is Diabolical Bathtub is right. The rig rundown with Doyle is one of the best episodes. First of all, that's Doyle super like, in his element. Doyle has talked about having anxiety or being very introverted. He's not an easy interview. As a matter of fact, two, like I'll never get to interview these guys, but if I could interview two people, like the greatest interview challenge ever, like the Mount Everest of interviews would be Doyle. Even more so than Glenn. I think I could talk to Glenn if I, if I got the chance, I've spoken to Glenn. I've had conversations with Glenn in in his very brief, but I had a conversation with Glenn. I've spoken to Glenn, but I mean, I think I could find ways to talk to Glenn. If I got to officially interview him in some way, I Doyle is like mm, to disarm Doyle. mm, That is, that's not easy. That is not easy to do. Um, That would be a very difficult thing. I've often thought about how I would do it. Uh, It would be like a Mount climbing a Mount Everest. But if you look at the episode on this channel, we did rock and roll cooking with Sal B and I was filming Sal interviewing Doyle, and Doyle is super relaxed in the interview. He's super friendly. And in that rig rundown interview, when he's talking about his gear, he's also super friendly. Um, there are plenty of painful interviews where you can watch Alex Story and Doyle totally screw with interviewers, and they do a pretty good job of it. And you know, and that's the thing about Doyle too, is if Doyle doesn't like the interviewer, doesn't like the situation, there's some good podcasts with Doyle too. He he just immediately shuts down. No, no, no. Like every answer is like, no, or I don't know, or yeah. You know, like just one worded answers. The dude puts up like this, this iron curtain, you know, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Kind of interesting. All right, guys, it's time for the main attraction. Let's open up, let's open up our magazine here. <laughs> 